Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander is underwritten by Task Performance. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Voikovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Hey, New Orleans, get ready for some rugby. There's a new pro sports team in town, and it's NOLA Gold, bringing world-class rugby to the Crescent City. The game is fast, the hits are hard, the fan experience is for real. Season tickets, lifetime tickets, and game day passes are all available at nolagoldrugby.com. I'm John Goodman, and I'll see you in the scrum. Embracing New Orleans soul with style and fashion wear from nolashirts.com. Show off your love for one of America's unique cities with shirts, belts, and hats in a variety of colors and styles. nolashirts.com proudly celebrates the culture and embodies the spirit and determination of people from the Crescent City. The tradition lives on at nolashirts.com. So here's the bottom line. you say that. Uh, let me tell you. Hey, good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports. Hey, I'm your host Scott Alexander. Another fun hour for you coming up here today. It's springtime. That means in May, that means the baseball tournaments the SEC tournament, the American Athletic Conference tournament, Southland tournaments are all coming up right here. But hey, I got to talk basketball first. But what a great weekend this was. Spectacular. Golden State, Houston. I got to bring it up first. That was Friday. You see Steph Curry and James Harden right there. They've been battling out for years. Well, Steph Curry in this game in Houston, game six, he had zero, and I mean zero points for the first time in his career uh, in the first half. Well, guess what? He had 33 points in the second half, 16 in the last five minutes, and they won a thriller in this series. It was a six-game series. It is over. Uh, Rockets go down again. Hey, how about this? The Blazers, the other team in the Western Conference, that is a seven-game series. It looked like it was going to go one way and the other at least three different times. The Portland wins this thing, so you have a great Western Conference matchup between all the guards over there, Lillard, McCollum. You got Klay Thompson. You got Steph Curry. It's going to be fabulous to watch. And maybe Durant. We'll see. In the East, the shot of the year with all apologies to Lillard shot against OKC. How about this thing by Kawhi Leonard to win it? Bounced around four different times. It went in to win that game in seven, win that series in seven, 92 to 90. Uh, it's going to be a great Eastern Conference final between Giannis and with the Bucks. Giannis out into the Kupo, and obviously you got Kawhi Leonard. That's going to be the first time in a long time. I think the Eastern Conference finals are going to be more compelling than the West. Saints rookie camp just started. It was a great start for all those guys. Eric, George, Eric McCoy, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, all of them were great. The Pelicans draft lottery is tonight. Cross your fingers that they get the first, second, or third pick of the draft. Also, Noah Gold Rugby, they lost an excruciating game to San Diego, but they're still in first to control their own destiny and points per game. That guy, J.P. Eloff, will be right here along with Tulane star Cody Hosey, the leader in home runs in the entire country. He's tied with two people. There he is. He's coming up on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. I kind of pride myself on having some unique type guests here. It's not all about the Saints, although most people do think that. I do love the Saints. You know that. LSU gets a big uh, chunk of the show. Obviously, the Pelicans and all the pro sports. But we hit all the sports. Man, we had D.D. Bro, who just finished second 
in the country once again in gymnastics. She's uh, the national coach of the year a couple of times, certainly the SEC coach of the year 10 times. But we have all kinds of sports uh, and rugby and all the other sports that don't get a lot of pub. But one, baseball has been a long, long tradition in the city of New Orleans. There's three sports that go way back, and I mean way back. One of them is horse racing, another one is boxing, and baseball is the third. And obviously football and basketball have creeped in and now become the big boys, but baseball's still going to be big in the, in the Crescent City. And Tulane is one of the reasons why the Tulane baseball team has had a great long history. They've had a couple World Series visits, as you know, in the last couple decades. But we have right here one of their best players and certainly one of the best players in the entire country as well. He leads the league in home runs of the league, the nation. He tied for two, with two other folks with 23 home runs. That is the most ever in an American Athletic Conference. He's also in the top 15 nationally in nine different hitting categories. Here he is. It's Cody with a K. Hosey, welcome to Primetime Sports. How are you, buddy? Good. Thank you for having me. How you been, man? Good. This How season, I mean, you, you've kind of been a whirlwind thing. You're kind of a part-time half-starter player as a freshman. Yeah. Last year, you had a very good, strong season. Big sure. time hitter, you had some help. And this season, you're just exploding. Uh, just yeah. kind of talk to me about how that feels. You know, it feels really good, you know, just to have kind of that breakout year, you know. So, I mean, you know, I was, it, it, I scuffled a little bit my uh, freshman year and then turned it around my sophomore year. And, you know, I could kind of tell my big year was coming this year, so. Well, you came up, uh, you know, you're obviously a highly recruited player. You could have gone Big Ten schools. Uh, you wanted to come south, which is interesting to me. You're from Indiana. Why was it the south, and then why Tulane? So, I mean, I wanted to come to the south because, you know, back in high school, it was just like our first game was our first time seeing a pop-up outdoors, you know. It's just hard to just hit in the cages all winter. and Because you've got too much snow and cold weather? Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, coming down the south, it, it's really helped my game out, you know, just seeing live pitching earlier on in the year and just stuff like that in the fall. You get to go outside, you get to develop better. So it's a, it's a great feeling. You were a shortstop and a very good one all through high school. Did you envision... I mean, you're, you're tall. I mean, yeah. what are you, 6'4 or so? Yeah, 6'4. And there's been 6'4 shortstops. I mean, Cal sure Ripken has. played short for a long time in his career before moving to third. Right. But usually the tall guys are first and third. What, what was the transition for you? Was it because they already had a shortstop, or is that because uh, you felt that might be your future? Yeah, I think it was more of the future kind of thing. So, I mean, just kind of the body type and the, the long lengthiness of me. So it's, I think it's more the body that fit at third base for me. And did you grow into this hitter? Because listen, I mean, you know, you, we knew that you have a frame to grow into, but we also right. knew that you're a very good hitter. Contact hitter, you'd rarely strike out. Yeah. Which is, I think, that's one of the big things. In my right. day, used to be strikeouts were something you wanted to completely avoid. It seems like they don't care anymore. Like batters right. will strike out 200 and something times in a major league season. Like that's not a big deal. Yeah. That used to be the worst thing you could do. Right. You're a contact hitter. Plus now you're hitting home runs as well. For sure. You know, I take a lot of pride in that. You know, I, yeah. no one likes striking out, but, um, you know, the power numbers, you know, it's, you see baseball going to it a lot. You know, you see the guys hitting a lot of home runs, but they also have a lot of strikeouts. So, you know, with me, it's more of kind of a hit tool first and then power kind of guy. You know, I think I still have power to develop. So I think that's where I'm at right the now. The ball now in baseball is not like the 90s where we had the gorilla ball and, and the guys right. were hitting 40 home runs for LSU. Right. They, they had record numbers. Then it went down to where you could... The ball was just, the bats, I should say. Yeah. The bats were like, you, you couldn't hit that many home runs. And now it's kind of a nice medium thing. But For you're sure. still leading at 23 the country. How could, did you envision that this could be a possible thing? Particularly coming out of high school when you certainly didn't have the strength you have now. Right. You know, I, I would never say I was going to lead the home, uh, nation in home <laughs> runs. You know, that's kind of a crazy thing to say, but... You know, it's it's definitely been just kind of a crazy experience for me, you know, and I'm just taking it all in and just, you know, just continuing to work hard each day. What about the city of New Orleans? What do you um, think about the city? I mean, it's not it's nothing like, I know you were about an hour, 45 yeah. minutes from Chicago growing up. Right. But New Orleans is its own little kind of uh, island. I mean, right. it's, like, it's a unique city. Right. When you got the first experience, you're right in the heart of it. You're right exactly. uptown. That's the area I grew up in. Uh, what, what was your thoughts about this city and uh, playing here in New Orleans? Um, at first I was a little shocked just about, <laughs> you know, just meeting all the people from here, you know, it was, it was an awesome experience, you know, and the people here are so nice and I love it all. So it's, it's a really good experience. But uh, you say you're shocked, um, yeah. just because of the drinking behaviors or what? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but it's just a little more like, uh, I don't know, just a little crazy, more atmospheric <laughs> kind of thing. So. 
Are you, what town are you from in Indiana? I'm from Griffith, Indiana. Yeah, so, I think 99.9% percent of the people that watch this show don't know where Griffith is. Right. Um, but yeah, so you came down here, you joined it. You got recruited by David Pierce, though, who's now Correct. at the University of Texas, and Travis Jewett took over. That's always a fine line with a player, certainly one of your caliber. Right. Wait, the coach that brought me in is not here, right. and now I have the, this coach here. What was that like for you? I mean, you know, you see it a lot in college baseball. You know, you see coaches moving all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, I, we were actually here in the summer, and then the David Pierce and Sean Allen left to go to Texas, and we were kind of just Trying left. to figure it out, right? Exactly. Yeah. We were just trying to figure stuff out. And then, you know, Travis Jewett came in. He brought in um, Billy, Billy Jones, who actually yeah. left as well. Yeah. And then he brought in Eddie Smith, and, you know, and everything's been perfect with Travis Jewett and Eddie Smith, you know. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I love Travis Jewett, by the yes. way. I love great his coach. personality. I think he's great for Tulane baseball. Um, yeah. Talk about him on the field because he he's passionate. Oh, for and, sure. And I, I want a passionate coach. I want for a coach sure. that wants to win more than yeah. I even want to win. Um, but talk about him as a as a coach on the field. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'd describe him as like a high energy type of guy. You know, he's he's all about the energy. He wants to win so bad for us, and it's just it's just great great feeling to play under him. You know, he brings the the team up in spirit and everything. It's just a great feeling to play for him. And, and you've seen Tulane baseball. You know, I know they're on a little bit of a stretch right now. They're going to yeah. get this thing turned up. But that, for most of the season, for sure, the majority of you guys been rocking and rolling. I right. mean, talk about the progression since your freshman year to where you are now as a junior. Yeah, and it's a it's a big turnaround. You know, it was for Travis Jewett's first year, my freshman year. Yeah. So you know, it was just kind of getting accustomed to things, getting used to him, his new coaching style. You know, and I think over the past two years, everything's just been progressively getting better. Right. You know? Yeah, so. and uh, moving forward, you were a 35th round pick last year. A lot of times people, and that was an age thing. I, just to, to clarify for everybody out there, you know, we all think, hey, when you choose baseball, you have to stay three years, which Correct. I think a lot of people would love to see that in basketball. But the fact is, is it's also an age thing. So right. you were able to get drafted because of the age thing. We don't need to get technical why. Right. But you decided to stay. I mean, 35th round, that's an either or. I've seen right. a lot of guys go just because yeah. they want to start going on the next level. Exactly. But, Tell me how, uh, why you stayed, and then more importantly, how has it helped you to stay? Because obviously, you right. went from a really good hitter to a fantastic hitter, one of the best in the country. For sure, you know, it was definitely a tough decision, just due to the fact it's been my dream to play professional baseball ever since I was little. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was definitely a tough decision, but it was a great decision to come back. You know, I've gotten a lot better, gotten stronger, gotten more physically developed and stuff like that so it's definitely been a great decision what are some moments and just give me like a, when i say off the top of your head when yeah. you say man if i if you left here tomorrow and you had to think back like a game or two what, what, were, the, what are those top moments that you, you're going to think about the top moments i would i would consider just um you know it's it's hard to it's hard to say it doesn't have to be on the baseball field like i mean i would yeah, imagine it would be right. but if it's not what, what are some things that you remember about your three-year stint here in new orleans you know, just just the time spent with all the guys on the team, you know. It, it's really been kind of just the culture kind of thing. You know, everyone's so close on the team. Great feeling about everyone. Everyone's so passionate about playing and going out there every day and trying to win. I've always wondered about this because you, you, you've played with some great players that are For now sure. on the next level. Yeah. And I don't know if they're all doing some, – sometimes people choose to do other professions that even though they're good enough to be in the minors. But right. like Hunter Williams, yeah, high draft sure. pick last year. Right. Do you stay in touch? With guys like that, do they? I mean, because yeah. they're in, they're doing their thing. They're in the minor leagues trying to become big, big leaguers. Right. How does that work with a teammate that you might have been close to? Y'all stay in touch at all? Yeah. So me and Hunter, um, he's doing med school now. So um, he's a great guy to keep in contact with. He had a great season. I think he was the American Player of the Year when he played at Tulane. So and then also Grant Witherspoon was drafted. Grant last. Witherspoon's the one. I yeah, mean, Grant, that's it. Yeah. Grant Witherspoon was drafted last year, and we just keep in Fourth contact. Fourth round. Fourth round, correct. Wow. Yeah. And what's he doing? Y'all stay in touch? That's, yeah, he's actually with the Tampa Bay Rays playing with the uh, Bowling Green Hot Rods. So the Bowling Green Hot Rods. Hot Rods. Like yeah. You, so we, you, yeah. Y'all stay in touch though? Yeah, yeah, we do. We stay in touch. And, uh, you know, he just kind of keeps me up to date on what he's doing. Just kind of like the things he deals with in the minors. You know, it's a great it's a great experience. It's I mean, like, minor leagues, you know, once you get to the big leagues, because I, I was around the Braves a lot. And, right. uh 
and I used to see the minor leaguers that finally got that first call up, and they walk around that clubhouse. They're like, "Oh yeah, this is what I've been dreaming about." Because yeah. the minor leagues, you're taking buses, right? Oh yeah. I mean, in yeah. the big leagues, it's all of a sudden you got a charter plane. Right. It's it's custom made for you. For sure. Um, are you looking forward to that day? I mean, because you're going to be a high draft pick. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts when you think about all this? You know, I'm trying to I'm just trying to stay momentary right now. You know, we got <laughs> we got we got a week left in the conference tournament. We go to Clearwater for so. You know, I'm focused on that right now, and then when the other things come to play, you know, I'll start. And you obviously have a those. decision to make because you know, you know, you you're at Tulane. It's not exactly. like you're given you're going to go. Um, right. And I don't want to get Tulane fans mad at me. I'm not trying <laughs> to get them to go. All right, <laughs> I, I love Tulane baseball too. All I want right. to stick around. Hey, but moving forward, what do you think the prospects going into this conference tournament? What do you got going for you? The, the, the wave. Um, as far as your, your chances, you know, yeah. going forward into the, you know, yeah. possibly in the tournament um, as well. You know, we're second right now in the conference, so we've got a really good shot. You know, ECU's in first. You know, they've already clinched the uh, regular season yeah. American Conference. So, you know, they're going to be a tough task to handle, but I think, you know, if we come out with our A game, we could easily beat them. Um, it, it's... Look, I'm looking at some of your teammates here. Who yeah. are the ones you hang out with the most? I mean, you're not going to offend people because like, everybody's got yeah. their group. There. Who are the guys no, on this team sure. that you hang with the most? No, so I I mean, being an infielder, I hang out with more of the infielders, you know, kind of thing. I mean, guys, though, those dudes like Yeah, that. Trevor at first. We got Jonathan Ortiz at second and yeah. Sal at short. You know, we kind of are like a clique that's, that hang together. We, you know, we're always working together, infield drills, all that stuff, hitting together. Go so, out and eat together, things yeah, like that hang out, Yeah, hang out off the field and stuff like that, you know. The pitchers kind of do their own things, you know. They all say the pitchers are a little different breed, but. There are different breeds. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, us infielders kind of keep close together. Uh, I gotta save the best for last because yeah. he's a friend of mine, yeah. Todd Graffinini, right. the guy with the magic calls. He is the <laughs> most. I say Travis, you was passionate. Nobody's more oh, passionate yeah. than Graffinini because I love tuning in a game. Oh yeah. Because I'll I'll get in the car and I'll be like, okay, let me see what's going on with the Green Wave. Right. And you can tell within a second of the inflection of his voice <laughs> how the wave are doing because that guy lives and breathes it, and you gotta yeah. love that. What what oh, is yeah. it like? To have him call in your games and probably has some memorable calls yeah. that you've done. Oh, it's awesome. You know, you can tell he loves he loves Tulane baseball. You know, he's very passionate about it, you know. And, you know, sometimes I go watch the games back um, on my phone or something and then, you know, just listen to his calls. It's awesome, you know. I, I just remember last year I hit the game tying home run against Houston and his call was it was it was unbelievable. Yeah, did, it can was you crazy. kind of remind people what was it like? What Oh, I, I hit like it. it. I was I, I think I was rounding second, and he's just going crazy. Just he like he loves oh, it yeah, exactly. Well, the old miss call became legendary, right? Yeah. When y'all beat them in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. I unfortunately wasn't on the team, but okay, was that the year before yeah, you? Yeah, Jake Rogers. That was hit the it. year before you. I yeah, yeah, that. but that's the one that got that went viral. Yep. and played for a long time. Yeah, no, it's fun. You actually are a twin of uh, a guy I live with. In Washington D.C., I and mean, I'm gonna throw it out Clay Nelson because yeah. you look exactly like him. I can't wait for friends of mine to watch it. They're gonna be like, "Look at little mini Clay," right. uh, although much taller. Yeah. Um, going forward, man, you grew up watching. I'm assuming the Cubs. They were 45 Cubs. minutes away. Is that your two or the White? Was the Cubs or White? It Sox? was Cubs. Yeah. Yep. Why is it Cubs always fan. Cubs? Everybody just calling it. It's Cubs. Um, I mean, they they were pretty bad when I was growing up, but, but it's still Cubs. It's, they were lovable. Exactly. You know, my my family grew up Cubs fans, and I think that kind of just stuck with me being a Cubs fan, you know, yeah. been to a lot of Cubs games down to Wrigley. It's such a fun time, you know, and it's great. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I've been to a lot of White Sox games, but it's just, it's just a different atmosphere down in Wrigley. Well, you are still an NCAA player and I know Tulane fans hope you are for, for another sure. full year, right. but we, I cannot give you gifts on here, but we can sign this bat. This, well, our football helmet with Tulane is completely full, but the baseball helmet was a new, uh, a new present from Travis Jewett. Recently, I've got Al Andrews on our task and obviously some of the coaches, but you are the first current player on here, and I'm very happy to have Appreciate you, it. Cody. Uh, your future's bright. Your swing is beautiful. And if you have a chance to get out and see Tulane, I don't know what they have left, but uh, you have many home games. Is it just We have four left, so one four, tonight. This weekend? One tonight and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So tonight, you can check that out. Uh, well, it's probably starting right now as we speak, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's going to be right. the magic of TV. Right. But uh, the fact is, check them out this weekend. Catch the Green Wave. They deserve your support, and they have done some great things this season. Congrats to Travis Jewett, and congrats to you, Cody. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. you very much. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, I'll take that helmet from you, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. We'll all be following your career. And uh, I want to thank him. Hey, this is, a, this is one of these unique shows because I have the CEO, 30-year CEO, CEO of, of – 
Thibodeau Regional Medical Center. He started this wellness center that Archie Manning and Mike Dettelier and Jen Hale, the sideline reporter, they are strong spokespeople and endorsements for this thing. And he's just got a great story to tell. We're going to have him on next with Mike Dettelier. Mike's going to talk a little bit about that Saints uh, rookie class and how they did this past weekend. And also one of the best rugby players in the world, certainly playing in the Major League Rugby. That is the MLR, where by points per game, the NOLA Gold are still in first place. This is Major League Rugby, and you're going to see one of their next coming up later in the show. His name is J.P. Elop, but coming up next, stay tuned for Greg Stock and Mike Dettelier. Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander is underwritten by Task Performance. The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachaise, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachaise, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Rock and roll will never die. It's old New Orleans, my, oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and roll. At the city lane, oh my, let's roll. Let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and roll. At the Gene's Po' Boy on St. Claude and Elysian Fields has been the place in the 7th Ward for many years. From the hot and sloppy tender roast beef, the crispy fried fresh caught shrimp, to the hot sausage and cheese, it's Gene's Po' Boy on the streetcar line in the big pink building on St. Claude and Elysian Fields. Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. Hey, I want to thank Co Cody Hosey from Tulane, the number one home run hitter in all of baseball, tied with two other folks, and also in the top ten in batting average. Hey, don't forget J.P. Eloff, one of the best rugby players in the world, certainly dominating the MLR right now. He's going to come up next, but right now we've got an old friend. He was just here a month ago. His name is Mike Dettelier. We're going to touch briefly on what happened with the Saints, the guys they drafted. Remember, we had him on before the draft, but more importantly, we have – the CEO for the last 30 years, give or take one year or two, of Thibodeau Regional Medical Center. His name is Greg Stock. You know how we have wild cards once in a while. We have restaurateurs. We have uh, some artists. We have musicians. And, of course, we have sports. But here's one of the guys I've been wanting to talk to for a long time. Here he is, Greg Stock. Good Welcome morning. Welcome to Good morning. New it's Orleans. Great to be. I'm <laughs> happy to be a wild card here. Yeah, today. you're a wild card, man. <laughs> Not the Joker, though. And Mike Dettelier, welcome good seeing back. You, Scott. How you doing, man? I'm good, brother. How are things going down at Thibodeau? Banging away. It's nice down there in the bayous. I'm going to say one thing. I know a little bit about the healthcare business. I've dabbled in it myself. And sure. I know that the CEO business, kind of like coaches, they're hired to be yes. fired at certain times. Hey, when things are going well, they love you. When yes. things aren't, they got to find a scapegoat. And it's usually yes. that guy. How have you yes. managed in a business that has tenure of an average of three years or less to stay as a CEO for 30 straight years? Well, we play good music. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's a certain musician. I saw an interview with him one day, and it was, why, why do people like you, your music? He said, we play good music. We play good music, baby. <laughs> so, That's it. You know, we try to run a great hospital, and uh, the, the care that people receive speaks for itself one way sure. or another. And, yeah, you have to make transitions personally as a leader. You, change your style for what's going on, I think, and you have to. be flexible and try to lead with real stuff, you know, be a real leader. Well, that reminds me of a guy you probably knew well, or at least know of, Don Shuley. He had to change his style, running guy with Zonka, kicking, obviously, Mercury Morris, and all of a sudden he got a guy named Dan Marino. He changed his style and obviously reinvented himself. But speaking of football, I want to talk to you real quick, Mike, about we talked about players that the Saints possibly would be targeting before the draft and, and a couple of positions were offensive line center in particular yep. and and safety because Coleman's gone. What did you think of the top two guys the Saints drafted, obviously in Eric McCoy and Chauncey Gardner Johnson? Man, listen, they got the second best center in this draft class. Eric is gonna be an instant starter for this football team. He ain't watching, he's playing and starting. 
on his team. He's been a terrific football player. Uh, Jimbo Fisher told me last summer, he's the best player I have on this team. Now, Texas A&M is so. pretty, pretty talented uh, right. on that football team. Had six players on the defensive side either be drafted or signed free agent contracts. Four players on the offensive side. So, you know, Eric's going to come in here. There is a transition period for him. But, man, from what I've seen, he's handled the best of the best in college football last year. Four first-round picks he went up against, and he made his name real quickly. Oh, my goodness, yeah. You're talking about the stars of the SEC, some of those guys from, like, Bama, Quinton Williams, et cetera. He did a good job on them. What about Chauncey Gardner-Johnson? I thought that might have been a steal getting him in the fourth round. I saw some of your projections. Yep. You had him as the second-best free safety. Fourth round is not a bad place to get second-best at a position, is it? He was my 37th ranked player. You got him in round four. Wow. That, that's an absolute steal. Uh, he can, and the one thing that came away from this rookie mini camp, listen to Sean Payton. Listen to what a coach says. He doesn't come out and tell you that guy's impressive, but listen how he says it. Yeah. He played corner. He played free safety, strong safety, played in the slot, can play on special teams. He's telling you that guy's a player – and the one thing with these mini camps is it's all about how quickly you can mentally pick it up. Physically, I know if you can play or not, how quickly you can get it between the ears. Chauncey Garner Johnson, he was an absolute steal for the Saints. Last thing before I get back to Greg, uh, you know, the late round picks, the Saints obviously have had success in the past, even the first draft that Peyton ever had, Colton and obviously Zach Streif. Uh, these late rounders. Ooh, Zach Streif. Zach Streif. Zach the voice Streif. of the Saints. Man, come but on. But guys like Saquon Hampton or maybe guys that weren't even drafted. Or Alizé Mack is a late round, yep. seventh rounder as well, the tight end on Notre Dame. And also, what about like a guy like little Jordan Humphrey? Any of these guys or any others in your mind sticking out that might have a chance to stick? Yeah, certainly as a free agent, little Jordan Humphrey from Love him. Texas. And what he was able to do, you saw him play a lot. A lot, yeah. University of Texas, big, tall receiver. It will help you out in the short, medium-range areas of the field, red zone. Divine Azebo from oh, Nebraska, yes, yes, or yes, halfback. Yes. He averaged seven yards a yes. rush on that bad football team? Come on. you got to give him credit. And this team, you go back through the history, if it's been Pierre Thomas, Kyrie Robinson, uh, Cadet. You can kind of go on and on. Chris Ivory. All these guys were undrafted free agents. azebo has got a shot here. The one guy I'm interested to watch, too, though, is Port Augustine from USC. Okay. Because he was hurt the last two years at okay. SC. But when he played, man, he, he was a terror as a pass rusher. Got great genetics, too. His dad was a former quarterback at Wyoming. His mom was the Gatorade Player of the Year in wow. Idaho. Played mm-hmm. basketball at BYU. Guess Along with his eight. Runners. And speaking of BYU, I couldn't have gotten a better segue than that. <laughs> See, that I set you up, I mean, you set me up perfectly. <laughs> we don't plan these things, but sometimes it just comes together. Right? BYU graduate right yeah. here, and I was a junior high, high school student when you were starting, and definitely a high school student when you ended. And I remember the lineage of great quarterbacks at BYU. And I, I, you, when you told me when you graduated, I said, okay, you must have been around with Mark Wilson, Gifford Nielsen, yeah. obviously a little guy named Jim McMahon who yeah. won a Super Bowl, and maybe another guy who won a Young. Super Bowl named Steve Young. Yeah. What was that like they being at BYU? You know, they, they lined up there, and that was an innovative offense at that time. That ball just went flying everywhere. Lavelle Edwards, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he was Edwards amazing. Was quite, a, quite a great guy, I thought. But. Yeah, those quarterbacks, I had classes with Gifford. They weren't personal friends of mine, per sure. se, but uh, I knew them, and uh, very personable guys, great guys, but they were they would come after you with that passing game, you know. <laughs> now, if he'd have been good friends with McMahon, oh, yeah. then we'd have had a good story there. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. We'd have had a story right there. That's for sure. He certainly has a couple on Bourbon Street himself. Hey, uh, I have to ask this, because I asked this to another yeah, uh, sure. guy from that – Went to college in Thibodeau. Yeah. That that Mike brought to me. Steve Watson was the is the COO of the World War II Museum. Yeah, He's I another guy, wild card that yeah, brought I know him. Him. But I wanted to ask you a question. Like I asked him, how did you? How does one become the CEO of the World War II Museum? Well, how does one become the CEO of one of the most innovative hospitals, literally in the world? <laughs> well, that's a long story. Um, I was raised on a ranch up in the mountains of Arizona as the youngest of five kids, and I came along a little later. I think my dad had a lot of influence on me. My mother, all heart and soul, but I worked with my dad a lot right. in these big open places. Uh-huh. And 
over the years, I've come to realize the stuff he taught me. You know, it, it, it was a lot. Yeah, my kid realized that per, one day. Per, profound, <laughs> maybe. But, you know, maybe I went Scott. To, I didn't want to go to college, and I, I did some other things, and I ended up. One day, I made the decision. Uh, How long after? Before you went to college, out, out oh, I was twenty-one before yeah, okay. college. Nice. Yes. All right, that's a good story right there. All right. Yeah, I did the mission thing in our church. I went to Alaska and British Columbia, okay. Canada. And that kind of helped me understand that other people are important in the world and not just me, <laughs> and uh, right. changed my values some, quite a bit actually. And then I came home. I, I went to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I took general ed classes for two years. I declared a business major and had economics counting and all that, and yep. then got married when I was 24. Hope I'm not boring you with all this. No, 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 I want to hear and, the, uh, yeah, this is good. Then, while, then worked on a big ranch uh, by the Petrified Forest for a year Richie. after we were married. Yeah, North 250 California. sections, a section is a square mile. Wow. It's out, four cowboys, so it's like <laughs> in the movies. But uh, I was raised that way, you know, that that's kind of home to me, that stuff. Sure. And, while I was there, I decided I really didn't want to be purely business. So I went back to college. I got an English degree. Which okay. Is pretty interesting. <laughs> and then degree. I graduated a year later, and I went to uh, graduate school. And I was planned to be a city administrator. So I have a master's in public administration. You can work in state or local or federal sure. government with that. But I really wanted to be a guy that man city manager, city administrator. And I met these guys in healthcare, and I. For some reason, it just how old, how old would you them. have been? Like thirty-ish? Yeah. I mean, twenty late. 20. Oh, I, I graduated the master's when I was twenty-eight. Yeah. A year later, I was a hospital CEO. That was a steep That's curve. That's crazy. Hospital Corporation of America out of Nashville, Tennessee, and a big for-profit uh, company, and it was you know it was a steep curve for me, but. I, I managed my way through hey, it. Hey, steep curves aren't bad. Uh, <laughs> hey, just, just appreciate them while it's happening. Yeah, it's, right. it's better than doing it's this. It's better than it's going on the other <laughs> end. But let's say, I mean, real quick, I want to ask something because yeah. the, the oil field business obviously was huge for South Louisiana so sure. long. And then obviously we know there was a, there was a boom and then eventually a bust. Yeah. And, yeah. and you came along during a bust time. Yeah. So you took a hospital that I'm not going to say was depleted, but it's certainly not what it is today. How did you make this hospital so innovative? Archie Manning, uh, Jen Hale, and obviously Mike Dettelier here are big spokespeople for you. Um, but how did this thing develop? Because now all of a sudden, I, I'm, I know some people in healthcare, and they always mention man, Thibodeau Regional is, yeah. is killing it. Well, I think you start with a vision, you know, and I, I think I have a little bit of a gift for that. I don't know where it came from, but uh, I always try to think ahead. And then it's, it's working backwards to where you are today and then putting the pieces in that will get you there. If you want to improve the health of a community, man, that's, a, that's a broad task, right? I mean, that's a big one. So what can you do and what can you make work financially? How can you really affect people's lives? Oh, how can you get support for it? Will people accept what you plan to do, whether you think they need it or the, you know, your heart is in the right place or not? And all of those kind of thoughts and lots of them go through your mind as you put a plan together and then you work the plan. Well, you have the Wellness Center of Thibodeau Regional. That's yeah. what I really kind of want to talk about. And the yeah. youth involvement with sports you get yes. involved with yes. and even growing and growing. Yes. Tell me how that came about. And more importantly, tell me what you're doing with it. What, what are they doing? Yeah. So, yeah. People so, know. so so first of all, there's, there's, there's about six purposes associated with that Wellness Center. Now, that's just a building. Yeah. Now that's a beautiful state-of-the-art building. It's a five-story, 250,000 square foot building. And honestly, I think it's as good as anyone in the country. I've been in a lot, a lot of them. Yeah. When you walk in it, the atrium, the natural light, it's a clean, well-lighted place, and you just feel healthier, honestly, <laughs> walking in. That. That's, that's you important. You should go there more, <laughs> Scott. I, 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 I agree? <laughs> yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> then the rest of it is what happens there. So it's a fairly complicated when you realize the other clinical services are in there. I've approached it that clinical, clinical is the basis for better health. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? So you take orthopedic surgeons right now, where there's eight of them in that building, and one of the young joint guys, we're working with him with people who are having their joints, knees and, and hips replaced. How can you improve the health of those people? And, and so a lot of them need to lose weight. They don't yeah. know how. Right. They, most people just don't know how. They, they have perhaps a willing heart, 
they sort of go on a fast for 30 days, then they quit. Yeah, yeah. That's typical. Then, Here working with the uh, joint surgeon, this is one example, there's a lot of others. Uh, we put these protocols into place that integrate wellness into clinical care. So it's a behavioral change and it's, it's a bunch of other things that produces better outcomes. You actually feel better. You, you can function better. And it's not for just when you have surgery, it's for the long, long term. So other, other things are, there's a whole bunch of them, sure. but here's another one. Okay. It's childhood obesity, the rate is 33% or higher and it's going in the wrong direction. And it's true in the Bayou region where I live and it's true in this state. And we, we're not ranked, we're not where we want to be as a state and certainly our area isn't. What can you do about it? So uh, we've been in the second grades and the sixth grades and done educational things, but here's something we're doing right now. We're, um, a lot of the schools in our area don't have playground equipment, if you can believe wow, that. Wow, wow. So we have seven schools in the Fouche Parish. These are grade schools, middle schools, mostly grade schools, that we're, we're putting those in. Wow. We have okay, about nice. four installed, and over the next 12 months, we'll do the rest of them. But if you walk on a playground, I'm going to tell you, you want something to get you in your heart. Walk on a playground where there's nothing but dirt. And then come back where there's, there's something and these kids get engaged in it. As simple as being active, you know, and, and rather than sitting and uh, doing computer games or whatever, which are okay too. But Thank you. Not really. You know, okay. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so all of that is about getting upstream from downstream problems that we see people have on the acute care hospital side. I mean, yeah, I one of the sense? things too is over a million people in the last two and a half years have been to the wellness center. One million? Over a million yeah. people have been there. Look at this thing though, look at this pool. And I mean, the aquatic this is state center of the art right is here. unbelievable. And I think for the workout facilities, it's over 5,500 people yeah. uh, work out there. I mean, and it's, it's unbelievable, Scott, to see it. At one time, that was nothing but sugar cane. Right. Sugar cane laying there. Uh -huh. And what they were able to do, the aquatic center though is, is unreal for the rehab of people who have injuries that aren't able to get on this, a treadmill or thing. anything else. The, the, uh, all these centers where they use, the, they have the bicycle, the workout facilities. It's uh, unbelievable Classes. state of the art. Yeah, there, there, in the first year, there were 350,000 visits just to the fitness center part of it. And that's been sustained. <laughs> there's yeah, still love this. just under 6,000 members, but there's a lot of other people who bring in there. And you can see a few of these pictures all right, of who would bring in youth youth groups of all kinds, uh, volleyball teams, basketball teams. So give me, be honest with you, you're from Arizona. Uh -huh. First time you made it down to Thibodeau. What did you think of those, those accents down there? I thought I was in a foreign country. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's not the only one <laughs> yeah. that thinks that. Oh, sometimes, oh listen, sometimes <laughs> even myself who grew up there, you got to listen real close. I spent a year going down the <laughs> road. Uh, oh. That was an eye opener every day. All right. Uh, pull it over, Scott. I got a ticket for you. <laughs> yeah, right, right on. You know that's correct right there. Frank, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Oh, it's a it pre really privilege has. to be here. Thank Man, you it, so it's, much. It's the cancer center. That's you, all you're doing. You got this. this We're building a new cancer center. Phenomenal. Big oh, state of the art. Look, I see the mock up right there. This thing's yes. amazing. So, yeah, I'm a two time survivor of cancer. Yeah. So, I applaud you for that, Mike Scotty, Love appreciate you so much. It, brother. You always bring me interesting people. Keep it up, man. <laughs> How many it, more brother. you got down in the I'm the middle man. No, I got yeah. plenty yeah. down there. Got some. Now you might have to edit I want, some. I want Ed Ogeron's mom. That's what I want. That might that, be the fun. That I might be able to cook up. We <laughs> heard some stories oh, off I the air. That like was that. funny. No, we've had Ed and we'll have mom. But I appreciate you. Thank you. Keep doing all that you do, at Mikey D. Thank Keep you, doing that. Hey, we're not done yet. Hey, we already had the two-lane baseball player. Now we're going back to rugby. This might as well be called the Nola Gold Show because they are the hottest team right now. They did lose a tough one this week. They had a couple big injuries, but they are still in first place. If you do points per game, like I said in the open, that's how I do it. Uh, and they play a big one this week against Houston. That's coming up with J.P. Eloff, the star of the team. He is the captain, one of the two captains, and he's going to come up next right here on Primetime Sports. Great job, man. Thanks. Man. I hope that was Thank you. Now
Hey, welcome back to Primetime Sports. I know people tease me. I'm becoming the NOLA Gold Show, but you know what? I'm going to say this right now. It's the hottest team going. What can I say? You're going to talk about the hottest teams. LSU baseball, Tulane baseball, I love them both. But they're not playing as well as they were earlier in the season. But the NOLA Gold, despite a heartbreaking loss this past week, still and when you look at points per game, I said this earlier, to me that's what matters because who cares if you have one more point in total points if we still have another game to play San Diego? That's right. So in points per game, uh, the NOLA Gold are still in first place. They have three games left. The, la the first uh, one will be the last home match of the season. That is this Saturday at 4 o'clock. Note the time change, 4 o'clock. And that's going to be over there at Gold Stadium on the West Bank, right on Shaw's campus, Shaw High School, Archbishop Shaw. It's going to be fantastic. Get on out there. We're going to have a lot of fun out there for that game. But also, this team has two more road games that are going to be giant. They play Rooney. That is Rugby United of New York, who beat the gold earlier in the season. They also play San Diego on the road, who also just won. So these will be pivotal for playoff positioning. Because right now, the first two are get home field advantage for the first round of the playoffs and then whoever has the best record going into the championship will get home field as well so the four teams that make it it's a battle between six but right now we have one of the stars certainly of the mlr and certainly of the nola gold his name is jean pierre elof we call him jp down here second year with the team last year was a lot of injuries and and he he had a situation where he almost uh passed away unfortunately but he is looking here now he's Third in the league in total points, and he leads the league in conversions. He does it with his feet, both ways, running and kicking. And here he is. It's a pleasure to have you on Scott. for the first time. Thank you JP, very much. JP, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Doing great, actually. And I didn't want to say that about the passing away thing, because <laughs> I, I didn't have a better word to say, but the disease you had is fatal at times. And yes. It could be, it could be uh, lethal. So let's just start there, because last season, okay. you, despite even missing several games, you were still fifth. In the league and total scoring, I think you still yeah. led. You still led the the goal. But talk <laughs> about going through that last season. Yeah, no, I did. Um, obviously, we didn't have the best season we could have had last year. But um, lucky day, we started off well. Um, unfortunately, a, a couple of games in, I I got the the situation chemical with chemical meningitis. meningitis. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, uh, was a uh, very shocking. Was something I've never gone through in my life. Um, luckily, great support from our medical staff the West Jeff Hospital and then obviously my team, they just had my back, my, my um, fiance at the time, my wife now. Yeah. I have no idea how she did it so far away from home and nobody with her here. Yeah, um, you're from South Africa. I'm remiss to say, you people probably heard the accent. You're from <laughs> South Africa. Yes, so yeah, talk about that. You're kind of alone here at yeah. the time and you're going through this and, and you're not sure what's going on with yourself. Yeah, no, um, obviously I couldn't remember much. So it was mostly my, my, my wife being handling all this by herself at the moment her, her parents from from michigan so a little bit far away eventually her mom, her mom did come down yeah. to, to to just support her in this whole situation and um, my brother that lives in houston came down a couple of days after it happened but yeah for the first 24 30 hours she was by herself but she did a great job and obviously had a lot of support from her, my teammates which are Great job, especially like Eric Howard and Zach was there pretty much Zach every day. Fuller, Eric yeah. Howard, great, great guys, by the way. Yeah. By the way, this is a great team of great guys, and yeah. I'm proud to be a part of this thing because I didn't know anything about rugby. Now I'm addicted to the sport. I truly love <laughs> yeah. it, and I'm hoping it grows here in the Crescent City, and, I, and it, I've watched it grow exponentially, and I know it's only going to get bigger. Yeah. But i got to start from the beginning. You know, why did you come to New Orleans? I know you went to Davenport, which yeah. is a big rugby college up north. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's in Ohio, correct? Michigan. Michigan, excuse yes. me. No, Once again, right. screwing that up. <laughs> Michigan. Yes. But, uh, but you came over to the States, but why New Orleans is uh, for, the, for the MLR? Um, I know. I was looking. Um, obviously, I, I played for pro-Ohio pro team, and then after that, I moved to Chicago. That's the Ohio connection. Yeah. I knew there was something. Played there. in Chicago for a little bit, and then obviously Taylor was in Ohio with me, and they came down here, and we was talking to Fitzy, and... I, I've I've played against Nate a lot, so obviously knew him, and then so you played against the coach, you talked to Fitzy, and yeah. then the other guy, is, is it Zach, you were talking about Zach and Boy, Taylor, Jeff, yeah, oh yeah, and they Taylor both came from Ohio, Taylor, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. So um, they just I talked to them, but obviously knowing Nate and knowing the way he coaches, and I talked to other teams too, but I just I just felt a connection with Nate and and with the when I, I came down here for a visit and then just loved the city. Um, it's been great, yeah. And you have your bride here now. You're, you're still Nullywood, even though you got married in September. Yeah. What's it like for a new couple here in New Orleans? I mean, you know, 
No, it, it's it's been great. Um, we can't complain. It's it's such a nice city. There's always something to do. It it keeps us busy. Um, yeah, we've been enjoying it a lot. Well, you have a fellow South African on your team, and, and you two have been both explosive, a, a, a big-time duo. You both got nicked up last week. Mm -hmm. um, we have some footage of you playing. What I like to tell people when they ask me to describe, I'm like, you're the rugby version of Reggie Bush. I mean, you have explosion, and people on here remember Reggie Bush mm -hmm. being a big-time explosive player. Yeah. But, man, I, sometimes I just watch you with the ball and you just take off. Um, what, what has been your, your synopsis of this team? There's Tristan Blewett, your teammate from South Africa, yeah. so far this season. Has it been a surprise? I mean, because I know most pe people picked you off fifth or sixth in the league, and here you've been in number one or maybe a little bit in two the yeah. entire season. Yeah, no, um, obviously after last season we didn't have the results we wanted. Um, but in my head I knew we can compete. I knew um, just had to make a few slight adjustments, maybe get one or two players, and we did that. And, one thing that's just our culture around the team has just been phenomenal this year, and that, that makes a big, big difference. I love this play because you saw some of that explosion I was talking about, but then the producer was asking me, okay, why does he kick right there? Well, that, if, if Blewett had, had landed that ball, that would have been one of the more magical plays of the season. <laughs> but explain that. Why, why do you kick when you're running in a situation like that? Uh, it's just, a, just another tactic. So obviously that last line of defense comes up, if there's nobody to pass to, you don't want to get stuck with the ball right there by yourself. So putting a kick over and maybe giving an opportunity to chase it, you still get a 50-50 shot at right. getting that ball back. Right, right, right. And, and if, you're, if you're somebody that was new to rugby, because I, I kind of I started when I was interviewing guys on the team last season when I knew nothing about the sport, okay. I would ask them to kind of explain a little bit. But lately when I've had some of the players, I just talk about the team. But let me go back to that, because there's a lot of folks out there, there's an explosion in the snow, and there you get a beautiful assist to Nick Feeks, who had the game of his life right there. Oh, yeah, three, he did. Three, three <laughs> scores, and there's Feeksy again. But the bottom line, look at this explosion right here. But to talk to, play, to, to someone that doesn't know about the sport, how would you describe what you're supposed to do uh, in this sport as opposed to, say, American football? Yeah, no, so it has a, very, a lot of similarities to, to, to football. Obviously, you need to get over that, that, that line of... Yeah, um, the goal line goal or try line, zone. Try yeah. zone. Yeah. Um, and you want to just keep moving forward. Where in football, you can just do it by running or throwing it. We, we get pass. We, can't, we don't get to pass forward, but we get to pass lat laterally. And we get to play multiple phases without stopping. So that helps. So if you can be dominate, get dominant carries and, and get your, your backs on the front foot, that usually helps you get over that advantage line and, and keep moving forward till you reach that goal line. You know, I, I, it took me three scrimmages to really kind of kind of get a little bit of because it's so foreign to us. But once I'm telling you, people, when you watch these pros, and this is the pros, I, mean, I don't know if you've had a kid that may play rugby mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's fun for them, but this is like the NBA and NFL of, of this sport because you see the crisp passing. That's what, that's what turned me on. Yeah. You saw some of it in some of those highlights right mm -hmm. there. You guys are so precision and technique oriented with these passes. You can't go forward, but you can go horizontal basically yeah. as long as it doesn't go forward. Yep. But talk about how y'all get that together because you're the backs on this team every time i watch a national game where we're featured like the last week's mm -hmm. game they, they harp on the backs we know the big guys are great on this team as oh, well yeah. but the speed from 10 to 15 those six positions they're all lethal yeah no they definitely and they have to be and that's why through through training and stuff we just got to get that timing and get it down to to perfection if we can get that ball passing where you get it nicely in front of you, full speed. There's not a lot of teams that I think can stop our back line. They really can't. And uh, I'm going to say this, though. A couple of you guys got nicked up last week. I kind of hinted at that. But I mm -hmm. want to ask you, we don't have this video, but you, people saw some of your explosion. Well, you got, you got a play where you took it off all the way down the field, and it was like one guy in your way. And I know you have the moves to get around him, but you also <laughs> have some power. So you decided to go right through him. And you kind of got your bell rung as well. Because I did. sometimes yes. uh, when you launch yourself, you also become the injured guy. Yeah, Tell no. us about that play and, and the repercussions of it. No, definitely. Um, I got around the corner there and, and, and it was looking good. I saw the one guy coming, coming across for that cover, cover tackle. And I, I saw Mikey Teo, their fullback, coming too from my inside. So I knew if I slow down and try to step him, Mikey easy, will catch easy. up. So it was either just kick it or try to go over him. So I didn't want to <laughs> lose possession of the ball, so I tried to go over him. 
Obviously, it didn't work out in my favor. It but. didn't work out. Well, I saw I was worried because the, the play continued a little bit. Yeah. And then you were just still on your back. And I'm like, oh, please, Lord. I got down on my knees and said prayer because I was out of town at my son's graduation. Yeah, yeah. And I'm watching. I'm like, okay. And now you're fine. Uh, you're going through the protocol. How does yep. it look for you this week for our last home game? Yeah, no, um, everything's been looking good. Obviously, our medical staff has done a great job um, pulling me from a field and making sure I get the necessary protocol done to make sure I'm not concussed or anything like that. But I've um, been doing, going through all the tests, and uh, it's all looking good. So I, I, I'll be set to play this weekend. Uh, Doc, we got to give him some props. Yes, definitely. Also, and Red as well, the, mm -hmm. the athletic trainer, continue to do a great job over there. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between this team this year and last year? Because the unity that I've seen, yeah. and I know that's the thing about rugby, it's a unifying yeah. sport, but this team just seems to have something a little extra special. I know Nate talked about it before the season, but I've been able to witness it for five months. Yeah, no, um, definitely a, just just a culture. Um, these boys are obviously you have your individual goals, but as a team we have the same goal. We want to be champions of this league. Um, the chemistry between the guys, everybody gets along. Everybody's working to get to reach that same goal, and um, it's never never one player. We are we're mates. We're not just teammates, but we're mates. We take care of each other on and off the field. You really are, though. It's easy yeah. to say. But you really are, and I watch this all the time, and you, you can see these pictures. You truly love each other. Every yeah. sport, people get excited and love each other. Mm -hmm. But this is off the field, too. I always That's said when I was doing baseball games with the Braves, you got some teams that have 25 players, and they take 25 cabs home. Yeah. Then you got other teams that genuinely hang out all the time together yeah and that's what the nola goal does mm -hmm. and that's what you, i think is unique with y'all because you truly do love each other despite the fact that you're one of two from south africa there's yeah. at least four or five from australia yep. a couple yep. from new zealand you've got a couple south americans yeah you've got three canadians and then you've got a few other countries and then you have some americans yeah. from all parts of this country that's very it true. is a wonderful melting pot of talent and personalities yeah just like the city like there's so many different cultures, so many different people from all over the world that's coming together, especially our team. And we've just embraced that fact. We, we embrace each other's cultures, we learn from each other, and we, and we grow together. South Africa, obviously the movie Invictus comes to mind. Um, how real is that? I mean, you were, I guess, a yeah, youngster with yeah, the very, Mandela very young. thing going on. Yeah. Um, but, but the whole, not to get too deep, but the apartheid yeah. thing, obviously there was a big chasm like there has been in the United States yep. with race. Uh, what was that like growing up there? No, obviously, um, it, that just that World Cup made a made a big difference in our in our country. The Invictus and, and, one, right? yeah, yeah, 1995 World Cup. Um, that just brought that country country together. Um, yeah, it was separated, and there's a lot of differences. Yeah. Um, but it's come a long way, and and it's a beautiful country, and I love my country. I can't complain. No, I love it, and I love your accents, and I love the athletic <laughs> ability. Did you grow up playing other sports there? I did. Um, I grew up doing track and field. Um. Kind of like in our schools growing up, you're, you're kind of not, not forced, but you're encouraged to do as much sports as you can. Yeah. So I do uh, track, and, track and field. I did cricket, a um, little bit of soccer. Well, not you're really obviously soccer. super fast. And, uh, but when I remember you telling me when I interviewed you before for the team, you, you do a lot of high jump and long jump, huh? Yes, yeah. Um, my, my favorite events are uh, triple jump and triple. long jump. So yes, you're sir. like the Carl Lewis. Yeah. You're fast and you can jump. Yeah. So did you did you just did you want to take that any further? Um I thought about it, but um rugby has always been a sport for me. I yeah. feel like just growing up, it's been in my family. Um, like my brother, he's, he played for the States here for the national team and I just wanted to follow in his footsteps. He's been a great role model Look to me. Look at young so. little JP right there. A little <laughs> jump here. A long what, time what's ago. The, what's That's the future sure. of this MLR? Because I see nothing but a a, a Bright, bright, uh, just to uh, go ahead and acceleration that way. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely heading in the right track. Um, just all the support and all the growth. You, just, just from here, one to two, it's, it's been phenomenal. And those crowds. We got the Benjis of the world. We got the AJs. <laughs> we got all these fun fans, the mm -hmm. Doug Arenas. They love being out there. I see AJ in his, his little jersey over there, the yeah, Mardi yeah. Gras jersey. But the fan support <laughs> and uh, all the people that come love to watch it. I mean, you've, you've watched it grow from the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, and, and you can just see it even from, from last year to this year, just there's so many more people out there and, and everybody's having such a great time. Like like you said, Benji and those guys just do a great job to get the fans in it. And, the and second get line, I mean, up. they had a second line, oh, a second line Mardi Gras Indians. That was I mean, so how cool, fun yeah. was that last week? They mm -hmm. had the parasols right there, you know, those umbrellas. Um, and you're yeah. just seeing it come around, aren't you? Yeah, no, and it's, it's great that they embrace 
like the NOLA culture with, with our games and try to make it themes and, and just having a, a festival and, and enjoying the game. Is your wife named Kayla? Yes. Okay, yes, Kayla yes. and you, I want you to enjoy this nice gift certificate. She will love this restaurant. Yeah. It is perfect for a young couple like perfect. yourself. Thank it's you very much. It's called Shades. Wonderful place. It's on Maple that. Street uptown okay. between Carrollton and Broadway, and it's, it's some of the best wine selection and wow. just wonderful food. And also task performance. Have you tried one of these before? I have not. Okay, this is uh, a New Orleans company wow, that is blowing good. up. And, uh, and Sean Payton and, and Drew Brees wear this all. That's okay. all they wear athletically. Really? Yeah, Mickey Loomis is the general nice. manager. They love it. And I know okay. you will too. No, thank JP, you very much. And, and here, this is a schedule. Uh, do you have one of these? I, uh, this somewhere. is good for two free <laughs> tickets. No, no, but two free tickets. But I'm going to tell people, this weekend is the last regular season game. They need your support. They're right on the cusp of first place. It's going to be for home field advantage throughout the playoffs. And the playoffs will start, by the way, on June 8th, the championship game, which we will be in, is June 16th. So, uh, And we can have home field advantage if they win and keep winning. There so go. there you go. Thank you very uh, much. There's your schedule. Put that on your refrigerator. Uh, that's usually good for two free tickets, but you there get free go. ones anyway. <laughs> hey, we want to thank everybody. Will, The Thrill, Hill, and of course our girl Lexi. Hey, Hunter, I know you're not here today, but you've been a great intern for us. So I want to thank you as well. And who could forget the Red Head Tsunami, a ball of dynamite right there. So I want to thank everybody at CST and WLAE. We're going to continue to bring you some fun, but we're going to get back into the Saints mainstream a little bit. Talk about the Pelicans because tonight is the draft lottery. So we'll see where they're going to be picking next week and talk more about that as well right here on Primetime Sports.